Patricia currently serves as President Emeritus of Inland Private Capital Corporation. She served as Director and President of IPCC from 2001 to May 2012 and recently announced her retirement from these positions effective last year. Prior to developing IPCC at the end of 2001, Patricia served as a Senior Vice President and Director of Asset Management for Inland Real Estate Investment Corporation, uh, or short, IRES. Ms. Del Rosso has been in, with Inland since 1985, which is amazing. You think how long someone's been with a, a company at this time, but she's been with them since 1985. During her long tenure with Inland, Ms. Del Rosso has spearheaded many types of real estate transactions, including sales, refinance, redevelopments, land developments, tax increment financings, condominium conversions, and over thousands of tax deferred exchanges. She has overseen the business plans of investor-owned assets, including multifamily, retail office, and industrial, triple net lease, land, and mortgage funds. As a founding member of the Real Estate Investment Securities Association, or RESA, Ms. Del Rosso served on its board of directors from 2003 through 2011. Patricia served as president of RESA during 2007-2008 and was the immediate past president chairperson of the legislative and regulatory committees during the uh, during, I lost my spot, during 2009. She also served as an officer and director of the Walk-In Ministry of Hope, a nonprofit organization serving the needs of the poor and underemployed in DuPage County, Illinois. As Ms. Del Rosso is also a member of the Investment Program Association, IPA, International Council of Shopping Centers, ICSC, the Urban Land Institute, and the Chicago Association of Realtors. Ms. Del Rosso is a licensed real estate broker and holds Series 7, 22, and 63 licenses with FINRA. She is also a member of the President's Council of the Real Estate Roundtable. We are pleased to have Patricia Del Rosso speak to us today. Let's give her a round of applause. I, I guess the mic's in. Oh my God, that sounds, that's like too much. It, it's just, you know, humiliating to hear people read that about me. Um, but I will say this about that. I, I think that, uh, number one, why I've been with Inland Real Estate Group of Companies for so long is because I love real estate. And I don't know if there are any folks in the audience that uh, are considering the possibility of taking the real estate path, but I can tell you every day that I went to work, uh, it was a new day, and I, every day I learned something new uh, in the world of real estate. It's just fascinating. Um, but my true love uh, at Inland has been working with the investors. Uh, and so my true love is uh, the investor relations and how that investor relations program uh, has helped Inland be successful, but more importantly, how it has helped the investors to be successful in terms of their investment returns, but more importantly, in terms of the confidence uh, that they have in Inland as their manager and asset manager. And so in thinking about that uh, and my uh, discussion with you today uh, about leadership, really that's where uh, my style of leadership, which won't be your style of leadership, uh, what I say today is just something that has been beneficial and helpful to me over the years. But each and every one of you are unique and each and every one of you will, through your, hopefully through your education and life experiences, develop your own leadership style. Um, you know, trying to pinpoint where did this leadership style, I'm gonna get out of the light here. Where, where did this leadership style come from? I really believe that all the credit are, is due to my mother and father. Um, it was my mother who had uh, a sense, or, and I would say peerless sense of hospitality and preparedness. That was an attribute that she was able to share with myself and my two uh, sisters. My father, on the other hand, was dedicated to helping people, but for money, but for money. 
he did a lot of bartering, um, and he would really go the extra mile in terms of filling people's needs. He was a car mechanic in the Washington, D.C. area. But he wasn't just a car mechanic in our eyes. He would go and make house calls, just like we don't hear about this much uh, with people your age. The doctors used to make house calls. My father would go and make house calls to the likes of John F. Kennedy and fix his car right on the premises. Uh, my father was a workaholic, for sure. Uh, there were cars in our driveway on the weekends, but there was a satisfaction that he received by identifying what the need was, what the problem was, filling that need, and serving his customers. And he has really passed that down, I think, to all his children. So I'm forever uh, dedicated to both of them for that. In my childhood, I did uh, uh, exhibit or demonstrate um, a very broad imagination. And part of that came from the woods. Uh, from the earliest age, I remember walking in the woods and feeling that what was around me was all treasure like buried treasure. So that, was, that really helped to develop my ima imagination. To this day, I try to, it's a little harder at my age, but I try to climb one mountain a year. One, I did three last year, but I haven't done any this year. So if any of you have any suggestions, I'll take that to heart. Um, I also uh, found a creative outlet in dance. Um, dance was a discipline for me. Uh, I was with a group where we performed, but we performed as a group. It was more like the Rockettes, you know, precision dancing, coordinated dancing. So that taught me discipline and really how to work with the group. And I believe that that um, love of performing precisely, perfectly with the group also played a role in terms of the leadership style that I was comfortable with and have you know, employed in my lifetime. Um, so when I think about the definition of leadership, um, this is what I think of leadership as, the art of caring for internal and external customers. Those, are here, those that are here and now, but more importantly, those yet to come. And, that, and hopefully Brad will invite me back for another lecture on long-term business thinking versus short-term thinking because I believe we think too short-term now. I believe we need to become better long-term think thinkers. What do I mean by internal and external customers? The internal customers are the employees, the people that we work with day in and day out. The external customers are the clients, and in my case, the investors. Those people that we're providing either a product to or a service to. Uh, the end result of what the internal customers do. But both customers, internal and external, are important to the end result and to those that are being served. And in, when I think about working with both, I believe it's most important to treat them like king and queens. Um, this, come, this idea comes from a children's book called The Princess and the Moon. And um, I can't recall the author, but I keep it in, on my bookshelf uh, when the little kids come over to my house and play at the house but to treat everybody with respect, to treat everybody, roll out the red carpet for everybody. And again, I think it, it harkens back to my mother's peerless hospitality. Um, is so, so very important in carrying out what any, whatever task you seek to do. To bring joy to others. This is critically important. 
We spend most of our waking and most are of our attentive hours in the workplace. Probably more hours than you get to spend with your family. So when people come to work, the internal customers, I believe it needs to be a joyful, a harmonious, a peaceful place, and one that fosters creativity and one that nurtures uh, the inspiration that each of the people bring to the workplace. This is critically important. Work is fun. I always said to myself, if I, if there ever, if I ever came to a point, a crossroads in my life where I was not happy going to work, it was not a joyful experience, it would be time to leave. Fortunately, I've been at Inland, it'll be 29 years at the end of December. Uh, and again, to meet the needs, not only the needs of the clients, the external customers, but to meet the needs of the employees as well. Do they need to be given time to go see their kids play soccer? Absolutely. And organizations, really the best organizations, the most incredible organizations, are the ones that take this to heart and create an environment that is supportive to the individual and the individual's family. And finally, um, harmony and strength in the partnership. Internal customers working on behalf of the external customers, but more importantly, working together. That is the strongest bond, the strongest partnership, and in my opinion, uh, produces the best results and the best companies. <clears throat> um, this, I would say, is, would be my business philosophy, or, my, or better yet, a core value. And that is that this comes from a Native American elder, a quote from a Native American elder. I like some of the stuff uh, that they t philosophize about. But so simple. We are all equal, unique, and of infinite value. In the workplace, I, I would ask my employees to embrace this or to sit, as, as I like to say, and meditate on it. We are each equal, unique, and of infinite value. And as to your leadership style, that will be true as well. <clears throat> so the style of leadership that I use is servant leadership. Um, this is not one that's designed to dictate or criticize or judge. Um, this is a style that is uh, focused on coaching and nurturing those in the workplace, the internal customers, and those that you serve outside the corporation, the customers, in my case, the investors. Uh, along the, it's a very positive approach to leadership. And it also is an approach to leadership that emanates from humility, but I think then supports humanity. It, I was uh, discussing with Brad and some of the others beforehand, he talked about the walk-in ministry of hope. One of the best things that I've ever done for myself in my life is to commit to work out our homeless shelter in DuPage County. Now, DuPage County is a very wealthy community, uh, and some people have blinders on and would say there, is no, there are no homeless people here in DuPage County. That's absolutely wrong. Uh, for, fortunately, where I live, we have a what's called um, PADS, Public Action to Deliver Shelter. Uh, and it is a uh, partnership with a lot of churches. And uh, we have five centers opened every single night uh, uh, from October through April. And then during the summertime, at least one center. So 
I actually go in uh, at 4.30 in the morning to make the breakfast. And my specialty is making the eggs uh, for the 50, 60 people that have stayed overnight on a pad. That's it. The pad's probably about that big. Um, I can't tell you how much gratification it gives me to work those short two and a half, three hours and serve these folks. And I try to make it a point to treat them like kings and queens, um, uh, uh, like a waitress, and go around and ask them if everything's OK. Would you like more coffee? Would you like orange juice? But more importantly, to sit down and hear their stories. Um, this brings great humility to me. And I believe that if you can get involved in volunteer work in some way, shape, or form, that too uh, will be important to guiding and uh, nurturing and coaching your own leadership style. Very important. To address roadblocks, roadblocks to success. I don't like to word, use the word problems. Um, because once that word, pro it's, it's a, a sort of an emotional response. Once we say a problem, people seem to shut down. So I never use the word problem. I use the word challenge. Or I, use, I talk about what is it do we, how do we need to get around, jump over, or crawl under the roadblocks to our success. So my style of leadership is very positive. I have been accused of wearing the rose-colored glasses too much, but it's, it's a comfortable place for me, a very comfortable place. And of course, uh, along these lines, the change that we create is not a change that we create from uh, self-centeredness. It is a change that is in partnership. It is a change, the results are occur not from the individual, but from the collective whole, from all of the internal customers and external customers. And maybe I'll give a couple examples of that later. I'm currently reading um, the autobiography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was a pastor, martyr, poet, uh, in Germany, and uh, I haven't gotten to the part where he actually tries to assassinate Hitler or is part of the group to assassinate Hitler. But um, I really like this quote. I think it sums it up pretty well. The good leader serves others and leads others to maturity. He puts them above himself as a good parent does a child, wishing to lead that child to someday be a good parent. And I, I think that says it all. I might even get a little emotional about that. <laughs> um, the organizational development uh, uh, philosophy, methodology that I have employed uh, in my work is uh, centered around what's called appreciative inquiry. Have you all studied this, AI, appreciative inquiry? Anybody? No. Well, I highly recommend it. Uh, the author, it, or the, uh, I guess the developer of this style, is David Dr. Cooperwriter. And you can s certainly Google him and uh, read his book. It's, it's pretty intense. And all I'm doing today is giving you a few snippets. Uh, by and by no means, going in depth as to appreciative inquiry. But he says that we are born to appreciate, value, and co-create. And I believe this is true. Um, it is like nails on a chalkboard to me when a manager will say, well, that person in the workplace, he's reached his full potential. He can't go any higher. Not true. Not true. And I hope that through sharing some of this about the appreciative inquiry method, as well as at the very end, and I think you got it, or you'll get it when you leave, it is a tangible tool, a practical tool, that you can use in uh, coaching people as a leader. 
Uh, but we are born to appreciate, value, and co-create. We are not born to judge. We are not born to uh, do comparisons between one another. We are not born to criticize. We are not born to dictate. Unfortunately, I think um, some of the styles of management and leadership are focused on what I call the Charlie Sheen method, <laughs> winning you know, through int intimidation. And this is not a comfortable place to be in. <clears throat> Appreciative inquiry is a search for the true, the good, the better, and the possible. And it's designed to create an organization in full voice, connected, people connected together, and organizations connected through their perfect form. So it is an imaginative and uh, a process of discovery. Uh, an appreciative inquiry summit. This replaces, for me, in leadership, the, the old school strategic planning session. The strategic, and I'm, I'm sure you've started to learn about strategic planning. This replaces that. I think this methodology um, is uh, related in some respects to a, a TV program they have on now. And it's called Undercover Boss. And this is where the boss, I don't know if you ever watched it, the boss goes undercover. Uh, the other employees don't know he's actually the CEO or the president or whatever. And he's more or less trying to feel like what the job is like at other levels of the org organization. So it's pretty similar here, only in terms of the strategic planning, this uh, Appreciative Inquiry Summit replaces it. And when you develop a summit, all levels of the organization participate. Typically, in a strategic planning session, it's just the top managers that get together, develop the strategic plan, and dictate it, plaster it on the other people in the organization. In the appreciative inquiry, all levels, and I mean all levels, I mean the uh, uh, receptionist who greets people and answers the telephone, uh, the, the folks in the mailroom, uh, the cleaning lady, who make sure that in an organization the kitchens are cleaned and the coffee, there's enough coffee for the coffee to be made and that type of thing. All levels. No, no one is uh, not included. It's all inclusive, all levels. These people performing some of those uh, more menial jobs have a wealth of information. I, I mean, I... Um, this is just a little side story. I almost didn't come to Inland Real Estate because I was very happy doing what I was doing for the Department of Labor. This is a long time ago. And literally, it was the, one, the cleaning lady at the hotel that convinced me to go out for the interview. It, it, that is a true story. I did, and then of course the rest was history. But these folks can have a wealth of knowledge. Um, the, uh, Charlie in the mailroom, he interacts with everybody. People tell him things about the organization. He feels things about the organization. So the most important part here is to include everyone. When you start the summit, you basically ask the question to the participants what makes you passionate about the work here that we do at Inland Real Estate Investment Corporation or whatever organization you're part of? What makes you enthusiastic about your work? Why are you happy to come to work day after day? For the most part, if you can't, and, and people are willing to tell you, they, are, they have a passion. They are willing to tell you. If there are those that are silent, well, those you might need to worry about 
Maybe they aren't happy. But generally, by the end of the summit, th that information is forthcoming as well. So a good bit of time is spent in the beginning listening to people's stories of enthusiasm and passion. And you don't want to cut that time short. It's very, very important. The next, the next element is uh, accomplishments or successes. So, and in my mind, I do this all old school. I use flip charts. So, you know, as people talk, we're scribing them, and then we're pasting these things around the room physically so people can see them and refer back to them. Accomplishments and successes. Accomplishments and successes are that of the organization. So people brainstorm freely, openly, talk about the accomplishments and successes of the organization or the company. And again, stories are shared. They're, st they're sh sharing stories that have meaning to them, that give them passion that give them excitement and enthusiasm. The next part is maybe the downer part, but eventually we have to address uh, what deters or distracts our passion, our enthusiasm, our accomplishments and successes. Another way to say this is what are the roadblocks to success? And people can identify them, no problem. So that we put those up on the flip chart. And then the part I love the best, uh, dreams for greatness. Now, uh, in terms of appreciative inquiry, unlike other organizational development uh, theories or practices, I always think some of those old school are, oh, you know, you hear the term, let's think outside the box. Well, I don't like that. I don't want to be in a box. I don't want to be in a box. Instead, I like the concept of the, peb <clears throat> the pebble dropping in the lake, and then you see the concentric circles ever, ever expanding. Um, or another metaphor or picture is the lotus blossom unfolding to its full beauty and it's full regalia. Organizations are the same thing. And I believe that this concept of the dreaming, of the imagination, to dream to greatness is very important. Uh, the, la the quote after this, I think, says it all, but it's, it gets inside people's being, it gets inside them physically, their body, and they become part of it they own it, you hear the, the term take ownership, but it's in them, it's in their imagination, it's in their passion, in their it's what makes them feel good, and then they own it. And then how do we get there? Once we've scribed and discussed and told all these stories to one another in the large group with all levels of the organization, then typically what happens during the summit is that we break up into teams. And as we break up into teams, we want to make sure that each team is not, uh, you know, not loaded with higher management, but that each team has all levels of the organization in terms of representation. And how do we get there then they take what we've done in terms of the big picture, now we're honing in, and they go into their groups, and they talk about, and they scribe, how do we get there to make it the best organization that we have envisioned? 10 more minutes, okay. Yeah, I thought this was gonna be really difficult to fill the time, but it's not. <laughs> Um, and then uh, after the teams are together and working, then they come back together and an action plan and then a discussion of how to measure that action plan is put together. Now this takes several rounds. 
generally, you know, uh, if you've gone through the summit and you've gone through everything and your teams are together, it's good to develop a draft action plan, but then you want to um, disseminate that and get people's further feedback. And I think one of the, one of the best pieces is, uh, of advice that I've ever used with folks is, let's sleep on it. It's important to sleep on it to think about what you've done. And then other, you know, you'll wake up, you'll be rested, the light bulbs will go off, you'll think of other things that could enhance the plan further. Um, the follow-up is critical. You can do all this good work, develop your plan, but if you aren't meeting initially, I'd say every week initially, then less down the road in terms of how we doing on our how we doing meeting our plan what are some things we can do to redirect some of the actions it's important otherwise it doesn't have the same significance and it doesn't have the same power to motivate motivate and move the organization um, to the to successful results as a result of the plan i love this one uh, from Aristotle, a vivid imagination compels the whole body to obey it. And I think this summarizes uh, the appreciative, appreciative inquiry methodology pretty good. A coaching model, it, it is a coaching model, it can be, and now I'm going to try to go from within five or six minutes, the 30,000 foot level down to a practical tool that you can use in working with employees. This is another summary of uh, the inquiry process. At the top, you showed what the discovery, what gives life, that's the appreciating, to the dream, what might be, uh, what the world is calling us to do, again, envisioning results, the design, and working together to co-construct or co-create what should be the ideal, and then the destiny, how to empower, learn, and adjust, and improvise, how to sustain uh, to the results. This is where I see the practical coaching model coming into play in terms of the destiny. Uh, this is just repeat. I'm not sure why. Oh, and this is another summary that shows the old school methodology versus the appreciative inquiry uh, methodology. So the old school focuses on what I, you know, the negatives, felt need, analysis of the causes, very analytical, uh, analysis of possible solutions. It deals more with the negative, the problems, whereas the per appreciative inquiry is a positive experience for all that participate. This is, and this is uh, what you'll get when you leave, this has been invaluable to me and I really think it emanates out of the appreciative inquiry methodology. But this has been invaluable to me in working with employees. And in working with employees, it is, it is the God's honest truth that you spend 80% of your time, most, most, of, most people, working with the 20% of the employees who are not performing. And um, so I have found this useful to help guide the underperforming employee to success. The top, uh, it, the top is really just the, uh, uh, how would you say, the heading, Employees Performance Interactive Coaching Model. The first, so there really isn't anything written on this form, and you physically use this form with the underperforming employee. At the top of the first one, two, three, that's typically where you'd write problems, concerns. But you don't write problems, concerns. Instead, you use questioning with the employee and you give the employee pictures and listen to the employee provide pictures to you as to what's happening in the organization. And you, quite simply, you start by saying, I'm here to help you, and I'm here to help you succeed. 
and then give them a picture of what you see happening. Maybe uh, the picture is that this particular employee is a kind of a loner and not participating with the rest of the group. Not cooperating, showing cooperation to their, te their team members or their fellow employees. Maybe that's the issue. And so if you provide that picture, then you listen to the employee. And listen is an important word. Really listen to what they're saying and what picture they paint as to how they see um, what's going on. That's, that's a very important first step. This uh, desired outcome should be more over to the right there. Uh, but you talk then about what, it, what is the outcome that they would like to see? What would be the desired outcome? And then you move to ideas to achieve that outcome. And this is very much a reciprocal dialogue, uh, relationship with the employee. And again, it sort of follows the appreciative inquiry uh, overall approach or model. Principles, next you go to principles, and why does it matter? You know, why does it matter that an employee needs to get along with the other employees in the workforce? That's where you discuss that. The alternative, well, the, the hard and fast alternative, and one that as you move through this model, and remember, as you're moving through, the employee is writing all this down. It's going to become his plan. He's putting his physical self. He's taking ownership as he's writing this plan down. Well, the hard and fast alternative would be, or consequences, would be, I get fired. And generally, as you move through the model, that will, it'll just come out of their mouth. It's just going to be very clear as you move through, and they will, they, it surprises you, but they will say, well, I guess a consequence would be I'd get fired. So then you move from that to an action plan. How do we overcome this, and how do we move to you be, being a cooperative employee in the workplace? And it's their ideas, and it's their action plan, and then af, at, at, at the end, it's important then that you review this. It, time should not, not much time should pass. I would say less than a week initially. You agree on getting back together, seeing how it's going in a few days, and then maybe it's a week. But, it's, but this follow-up again is so, so important. Very critical. Both the employee, it's their plan, they sign it, and then the supervisor signs it as well. Um, unfortunately, in this, era, in this life of litigation, the world of litigation that we live in, so many uh, managers uh, don't give the employees a chance to succeed, don't take the time to allow them to succeed. Uh, and as a result, they have problems and claims and litigation from the employees as to why someone is let go or fired. This is so useful to have the employee's signature on this document. I can't tell you how many times over the 29 years, and it hasn't really, it hasn't been that many, thank you, um, uh, the, a, an employee uh, has maybe filed an unemployment insurance claim, and this is costly for businesses. And because of this tool, we have won. The organization has won. It's the employee's plan. They knew what the consequences were. It's documented. A lot of man managers don't document. They just you know, react or overreact in many cases. It also is interesting that as you move through this model, you will, what happens is uh, both the employee and the supervisor will realize or recognize who's coachable and who's not coachable. And more often than not, 
It will be in the employee who says, you know, Patricia, I'm not coachable. And they resign and leave on their own. So it helps to raise that issue to the surface. Um, and actually, most of the time when I use the model, if the person isn't uh, coachable, they actually put in a letter of resignation and leave on their own. It's, it's very powerful. But I would say the most fulfilling part of my job, my 29 years at Inland, no question about it, has been coach coaching and nurturing the people. Um, my, one of my first secretaries, uh, Lupe Griffin, is now the Director of Asset Management for Inland Real Estate Investment Corporation. Lupe didn't have real estate or a business degree. Uh, she learned it on the job and um, through coaching, nurturing, uh, trying new things, uh, believing in her, her believing in herself, she's now one of the key leaders at Inland. Another gentleman that worked with me as an asset manager is now the CEO of one of our most successful real estate investment trusts that trades on Wall Street. Um, if, you know, if, if I want to have a legacy or a legend, this is it. It's the, it's the success uh, that these other folks have achieved. And I, I almost gave up on one guy. Uh, he drove me crazy because he couldn't communicate or was not, didn't seem like he was communicating properly with the external customers or the internal customers. And I almost gave up on this person, but we used this co coaching model and it became clear to me that this individual was coachable and would succeed. And I never would have known it had we not gone through this, that what the issue was in terms of the communication was in his home, they only spoke Italian. I had no idea. Once we were able to clarify they only spoke Italian, which is very beautiful, by the way, I love it. Um, we, then we were able to pinpoint and work on the, writing, the, the written and the verbal communication skills, of course, using English. This person is a very successful, has remained with me and uh, not with me now, is off on his own and uh, actually trans has transacted billions, multi-billion dollars in uh, real estate sales uh, for Inland. So with that, I thank you. And uh, I guess we take questions. Oh, I stay up here? OK. Oh, here's one. Uh, my question is, you working with other executives and trying to implement models like this, was there any friction that you came against with other executives that were maybe trained in the old style? Uh, yeah, I, al I almost grabbed this mic to say, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I, th I think this is something in working with top management, you, you need to dialogue about. This is the leadership style that I use. Um, this is how we're working within the organization. But you were right there. It's an excellent question. Uh, and so you need the top leaders need to dialogue about it as well. Absolutely. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, how often do you hold one of these appreciative inquiry summits? I like to hold them once a year. Uh, but the follow-up, I think, is critical. And of course, when, when I talked about the follow-up and the measurement, starting weekly, then maybe you move to quarterly, uh, at least quarterly. Never do it less than quarterly. But once a year. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned that you would leave your job if you ever didn't, if you ever woke up and felt like you weren't enjoying it. Uh -huh. um, what is it about real estate that that you love, or is it something that you've figured out mentally that makes you want to come back yeah. each day? What I love about real estate 
and, I, and, phys and I'll do physically, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, what I love about real estate is, you know, there, the, there's not, I, I love the downtimes in real estate, and I tell the young people, that's when you learn the most about real estate. <coughs> Excuse me, when you have to face a recession, tenants are going bankrupt, tenants are leaving, um, uh, you can't find financing. This is when you really have to use your imagination and be creative to make the deal work and, and the motivation that you have investors that own these properties, that's a strong motivation to do that. We always employ parallel strategies. So, you know, we may work with different lenders on financing if that's in the uh, issue, not one lender, many lenders. We may also try to structure some seller financing or some creative financing. Uh, we may be traveling down the path of, well, if we could replace the tenant at a higher rent, then that's going to give us more financing, uh, a number of different strategies. And as you follow those strategies, hopefully you're going to come to the, the optimal result. Mm -hmm. It's creative. <laughs>